Hello and welcome back to the Air Armoury, I'm JRH and today I'm looking at the Bakel IJ-22 air rifle. So this rifle, the IJ-22, is a uh, plinking rifle made by Bakel. Now I'm sure many of you are aware of Bakel, but for any of you who aren't, they are a Russian manufacturer of firearms, air guns, uh, as well as a number of other things, including power tools. And they are made at, I'm sure I'll get the pronunciation of this wrong, the Azevsky Makhnevsky Zavod factory in Western Russia, which the Blue Book of Air Guns actually tells me is a state-owned factory. Now that factory was founded in 1942 um, and it is still going strong today, still making Bakel air guns, but I did read that it's actually now run by the Kalashnikov company. Although the factory was founded in 1942, I'm not sure exactly when the Bakel name was first introduced. Um, the research I've done seems to suggest it first appeared in the 60s at some point, um, but it was definitely in use in the 70s when this gun was made. Now I don't have the exact dates of manufacture for the IJ-22, uh, but everything I've read seems to say 70s. I do have a reproduction instruction booklet for it, which is dated 1976. Now, uh, despite Bakel being a Russian brand, the Russian Federation, as it's formally called, was only established in its modern form in 1991. Uh, prior to that it had been the Soviet Union, and that makes some interesting markings on the gun, which you'll see later in the video. So, let's take a closer look at the Bakel IJ-22. Some stats to start with. The rifle is 41 inches or 104 centimetres long and it weighs 5.3 pounds or 2.4 kilograms. It has a 17 and three quarter inch or 44 and three quarter centimetre long rifle barrel. Uh, the barrel is, as you'd expect, steel, but it does have a brass lining, you can see there, as well as some of the rifling. And this gun is in 177, which is the only calibre it was made in. Now, as you just saw, this is a brake barrel rifle uh, and therefore a spring piston powered gun. Now, with most, but by no means all, brake barrel rifles, you just give the barrel a uh, sharp pull down to break the action um, and unlock the barrel. Now there are of course numerous exceptions. Uh, the one that I'd expect most people to think of would be Virarch's distinctive barrel release catch and the IJ-22 here um, also has its own unique barrel release mechanism. So to break the barrel you push down on this catch at the side there. And now I really like the look and design of this barrel release catch. It's actually one of the reasons that made me buy an IJ-22 when I first became aware of them. It has a hardwood sporter style stock. Now I really like the stock on this gun. I think it's very nicely shaped. Things like how it tapers down here at the front of the fore end and this kind of raised piece around the inset disc. Uh, more on that in a minute. And it also has some grooves cut in the side to add grip. Now one of the distinctive things about the IJ-22 is its dark red plastic furniture which are the trigger guard, the cap on the end of the pistol grip and the butt plate. That's quite hard to see but these are actually just a very dark red and these white bits are just plastic spaces. Now whilst the red plastic is one of the things that the rifle is known for, I do actually have two IJ-22s and the other one here has a black uh, trigger guard. Now it looks original but I haven't personally seen any others with a black trigger guard and on this gun it's only the trigger guard that's black. The butt plate and the pistol grip are both red. So next thing I'm going to do is actually take the stock off as it's quite interesting under there. A nice detail on the IJ-22 is there are metal protective screw cups set into the stock. Mm -hmm. 
So here you have the cocking link, uh, but unusually this is almost uh, free floating. It's just held in place by this welded on uh, support here, which is also the part the stock screws attached to. And the reason for that is that unlike on most brake barrel rifles, the cocking link itself doesn't go through the cutout in the main cylinder and interact with the piston that way. Uh, instead, it just runs along flush with the cylinder and this flat surface pushes against uh, this part of the piston which protrudes out that way. Uh, moving back, we've got the trigger unit and this has actually got a really interesting uh, handy feature to aid disassembly in that the whole thing is just held in in a bayonet style fitting. So to remove the whole trigger unit as one piece you first need to just knock out the uh, retaining pin here but then you can see there's more space on this side than on this side and then there's a little pin it's held in place there so once that main pin is out you just twist this whole thing sideways and pull that out the back uh, along with the spring and the piston. Um, well, I say pull them out, obviously you need to be very careful um, to make sure that the whole lot don't get flung out the back at high speed under spring pressure. Now the trigger itself is a non-adjustable single stage metal trigger blade. Now it's not a horrible trigger but nor is it fantastic. There's a certain amount of creep uh, but the main problem I find is that you can't really feel when it's about to break um, and that makes it quite hard to shoot in a predictable manner every time. But you know, it's not exactly a competition trigger, um, so it's not too big a deal. The IJ22 doesn't have a safety as such, but it does have a safety mechanism built in, in that you can't pull the trigger until both the gun is cocked and the barrel has been closed. And that actually works in a two-part system. So first of all, without the rifle being cocked, you can't pull the trigger. And that's because the trigger hasn't been engaged yet. So this here is the sear and when the piston, which these two tabs are connected to, uh, is pushed all the way back by the cocking link, the sear drops down and engages with this uh, first tab, but this second smaller one uh, slides in underneath and trips a lever inside the trigger block which uh, engages the sear. Now I'm not going to try and cock the gun with the stock off, but I can show you manually by engaging the sear this way and with the sear engaged and the barrel closed I can now pull the trigger but if the sear is and trigger are engaged but the barrel isn't closed this metal piece here uh, prevents the trigger being pulled so how that works is if I engage the sear again You can see that this uh, bar is pushed down because of this pin in the cocking link. Uh, but when the cocking link slides back, uh, this bar runs over that pin and is pushed back up under the pressure of this spring in the trigger unit. And on the other end of this bar is a little kind of hand that goes down behind the trigger. So as it is now, um, the barrel is closed so this is pushed down, I can pull the trigger. But if I again re-engage the sear, uh, I can mimic the barrel being opened by actually just lifting this piece to the side and pushing it up. That hand then blocks the trigger from being pulled. But if I put that so it's riding on that pin again with the barrel closed, I can pull the trigger. The IJ22 is limited to open sights, uh, there's no facility to mount a scope, there's no scope rail or anything. The front sight is just a fixed metal blade on this uh, wider piece at the front of the barrel. Uh, and the rear sight is the definition of simplicity in terms of adjustable sights, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just a flat strip of steel bent up at one end with a notch cut in it and then an adjustment wheel for the uh, elevation um, with the sight itself acting as a flat spring to keep tension and then it's held in place with a dovetail so that it can be adjusted for windage. 
Now these sights are surprisingly okay, I do like them and you actually get a better sight picture than you do on a lot of other guns with better and more advanced sights. With regard to markings, on most rifles you'd expect to find the bulk of the markings on top of the main cylinder here, but that is completely blank on the IJ-22. Instead the majority of the markings are on fixtures on the stock. So on either side of the stock there is an inset plastic disc, I don't know how well you can see it but it says IJ-22 made in the USSR. Um, the USSR of course being the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics um, and that comes back to what I was saying earlier on about this being a Soviet made gun which I think gives it a cool historical aspect. And then on the butt plate we have IJ-22 uh, this time using characters from the Russian Cyrillic alphabet um, which match those on the front of this reproduction booklet I showed you earlier on. Uh, I'm not actually sure at all what's in this booklet though as it's entirely in Russian. Anyway, back to the gun. Uh, the only marking on the metalwork itself is the serial number which is found on the left hand side of the uh, flat surface on the barrel. Uh, this one being uh, 13,517. Now I don't know what the serial number range is so I don't know how many were made. Uh, my other one has a serial number of what looks like C14467 so it looks like they started using uh, letter prefixes at some point. Interestingly you've probably noticed that it doesn't actually say Baikal on it anywhere. I'm not totally sure why but I suspect it was so the uh, branding and distribution rights could be sold off uh, similar to how they are with a lot of modern Chinese guns. And the reason I say that is because although it was made by Baikal uh, it was generally marketed internationally as the Vostok IJ-22 uh, with a couple of specific exceptions I'm aware of. Uh, in the UK it was sold as the Milbro G530 and in the USA it was sold as the High Score 817 Mark III. Uh, I'm now going to do some shooting and testing of the rifle. I'm first going to test the accuracy and I'm going to fire 10 pellets at one of these 14 centimeter square targets at a distance of around 12 meters using these 8.4 grain Air Arms Diablo Field pellets. Here I have my target. Now, as you can see, most of the pellets are in a nice central group with seven in or at least touching the uh, inner blue circle. Uh, there are just a couple of slight strays, uh, but they're still not too far away from the main group. Uh, so for open sights, I'm really happy with that. I have guns that aren't even that accurate with a scope. Uh, I'm now going to test the power by firing another 10 of those Air Arms Diablo Field pellets over the chronograph. Here I have my chronograph test sheet and I've already done all of my calculations. Now with those 8.4 grain Air Arms Diablo field pellets I got an average velocity of 499.59 feet per second with a spread of just 18.1 feet per second, uh, the highest being 510.8 feet per second and the lowest being 492.7 feet per second. So using that average of 499.59 feet per second that gives me a power of 4.66 foot pounds. So not massive power but perfectly adequate for plinking. The only data I can find on what they were supposed to get when they were new is in the Blue Book of Air Guns which says that they were supposed to be between uh, 410 and 498 feet per second. Now I'm not sure if my gun has had a new spring or anything at any time in the past but in terms of velocity it seems to have aged well. So there you've seen the Bakel IJ-22. Uh, now I really like this rifle, uh, I think it looks good with the shape of the stock and that inset USSR badge, uh, it's got the interesting barrel release catch and it's reasonably nice to shoot. 
Now, I don't have a lot of budget or storage space for 70s plinkers from Eastern Europe, but the IJ-22 is my go-to gun in that category. Now, although the rifle hasn't been made since the 70s, there are plenty of them around, and you won't have to wait long to find one come up for sale online. And with regard to price, you can expect to pay around maybe £50, uh, a bit either way, depending on condition. So, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Uh, if so, be sure to like, comment and subscribe to the Air Armoury. And until next time, keep your arms in the air.